Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hey, I'm Holly Fry. I'm Tracy B. Wilson. Uh, and welcome once again to Casual Friday with <laughs> Stuff You Missed in History Class. So to th- this week we talked about uh, Joan Curran, who is a scientist that has just not gotten her due in the public sphere, in my opinion. I don't know how I stumbled across her. This is, I do not remember. I literally have uh, multiple lists that I keep in various states of disarray. I have one on my phone that are potential episodes, but then I also have like kind of my adaptation of like a bullet journal style notebook that I keep with me and keep all my stuff in. And literally scrawled on one of the pages like two months ago is the name Joan Curran. And I don't (laughs) remember how I got to it. But then I went back to it recently, and I was like, wait, why didn't I jump right on this? Um, yeah. And I, I don't know why. Maybe because I've been talking about a lot of science lately. But I, it was one of those things where the refreshing and beautiful part of it to me is how over and over the men who were her colleagues and friends were always very quick to correct people who did not recognize that she was a heavy-hitting, brilliant scientist in her own right. Which is awesome. Yeah, that's not something that you always hear. Like, there was one instance, I'm going to get some of the details wrong because I don't have the the notes right in front of me, but where one of her friends recounted when he was, like, first meeting their family and they were at some, like, academia event, and she was sitting at this table with other physicists, and it was, I believe, when her her husband Samuel was was head of the the University of Strathclyde's um, science department, and someone said something about, you know, what a good sport she was to sit there and listen to them. And, like, two of the men at the table were like, "Um, she's smarter than the rest of us put together. (laughs) (laughs) So, like, that is a really lovely thing that her colleagues were never... She seemed to not uh, suffer that situation that happens with a lot of women scientists where it's like, that's cute that you did research. The men are talking. That never seemed to happen. Yeah. Uh, particularly considering that she was working in the 1930s and 1940s when it was a lot less common for a woman to have a seat at the table in terms of the level of research she was doing. And clearly, like, the Royal Air Force and British leadership recognized that this was a smart person who needed to be utilized for her intellect to make contributions to the war effort, Mm -hmm. uh, which was kind of, to me, the best takeaway from that whole thing. You know, talking about war is very difficult in general. As I get older, it gets harder and harder to read some of these accounts because uh, the more you learn about the world, the more you recognize, like, the, the depth of impact of even sometimes seemingly small gestures or small moments. But we like i never really learned the degree of devastation of hamburg during the raids during operation gomorra yeah um i remember getting a very very brief version of it like in high school of like these were very big bombing raids. There were civilians killed. But I literally had not ever until I dug into her story and that particular result of her work, like, how horrifying it was. And everyone who lived through it and later spoke about it talked about being really like a hell on earth. And what's really interesting in that as well is even the men who were involved in that raid on the Allied side talking about how at the time they were like cheering because they thought it had gone so well. And when they realized what had really happened and how completely destroyed Hamburg was, like they all felt a weird sort of um, conflict and guilt about it that I think a lot of them were dealing with for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I said in the show, but I, I feel like the the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki get a lot more attention, at least here in the U.S., um, than all of the other destruction leading up to that point. When it like that wasn't something that was unique to the end of the war. No, and it and you know it's it's just one of those things that makes you think about the things that humans will do to one another. Yeah, in the names of strange strange efforts. Yeah, on a on a potentially lighter note. As you were researching this, did you find anything about, like, the cleanup effort of all of this material that was dropped around? Because it just seems like a lot. 
Um, you know what? I didn't. But it is a good question. I mean, I kind of suspect that what happened in a lot of cases, although I don't know for the the D-Day prep where they were using it really more as a, a sort of wartime theater effort, this would not have been the case. But when they were using it during bombing raids, I suspect that there was so much destruction in general that kind of that material got lumped into the general cleanup without really mm-hmm. separating out what that was versus, you know, collapsed buildings versus, you know, the loss of human life. It all kind of got lumped together as one big problem to rebuild from, uh, would be my guess. But I don't know, and that's a good question. Other than knowing that a cow ate some, I really yeah. don't have a lot of info about what the cleanup was on all that aluminum. There are still some places that have those strips of aluminum that have been recovered as, like, museum pieces. Right. I saw some of those when I was uh, browsing around the internet. It was one of those things that I was just curious about. And there are also things that are surely much more damaging than window that is left behind during wartime. I mean, we we have unexploded ordnance that we need to right. talk about on unearthed pretty frequently. Right. But I was just curious. It is fascinating. It was painted black because they didn't want the reflective nature of aluminum to give away anything either. Right. So in some cases, I suspect people didn't recognize that it was aluminum stripping versus part of a a damaged building or other bomb damage. Okay. Because it didn't look like a shiny metal thing. That would be my guess. Yeah. So the second thing that we talked about this week was Murasaki Shikibu and the tale of Genji. My introduction to this, as was the case with Sei Shonagon, was a class that I took in college called Medieval Women Writers, uh, which has actually inspired a number of episodes of this show at, at this point because other people that we read included Marjorie Kemp, Uh, The Book of the City of Ladies we read in that class. Like, there was a a lot of things that over the past several years have eventually made their way into episodes. Uh, But this was a class, unsurprisingly, a class about medieval women writers, which was an elective taught in the literature department of a university that had more women than men at it, was taught by a woman and had a majority people in the class, mostly women. And boy, did we think Genji was gross. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, the translation that we read was one of uh, was by Edward Scheidensticker in the 70s, and we did not read the whole entire book because that's just not reasonable in the course of a college class where you have like 10 different works that you're going to read when it's 1,000 pages long. Um, but we had this abridgment where all of the chapters that we were reading were from the earlier parts of the book. So all of the chapters that we were reading were about Genji and his affairs and just the very skeevy part of abducting a 10-year-old and grooming her to be his wife. Um, and we were all like, we don't like this guy. He seems like a player. He's you know, breaking all these women's hearts and causing all this emotional wreckage. Um, And our professor was like, yeah, this was like, this was the edition of the book we had available to us. It's unfortunate that it only includes material from the early chapters of the book because you only see like uh, player Genji. You don't see old sad (laughs) Genji from later on when it's like all of his youthful pursuit of all of these women has, like, caught up with him, and he is sad and wistful and wants to just become a monk and leave the world. Um, And we were all like, we we don't really care, though. We still think he's gross. (laughs) (laughs) I love that you have such an academic introduction to that and the pillow book, because my introduction to the pillow book is from the 1996 Peter Greenaway film of the same name. Oh, yeah? Which, I don't know if you've seen it. Uh Uh-uh, I don't think so. Um, it is, say Shonagone is listed as one of the writers, uh-huh. along with Peter Greenaway, but it is not. <laughs> <laughs> um, it stars Vivian Wu and Ewan McGregor, and it's a really beautiful film. If you love Peter Greenaway, which I do, he is not for everyone. So I then, after seeing it, was like, wait, this is, it lists, a, like, a writer from hundreds of years ago as one of the writers. So I looked it up from there, and that's how I got introduced to that. Similarly, not entirely similarly, but The Tale of Genji I got introduced to because I was working as an acquisition specialist in a college library, and we got a CD-ROM version of The Tale of Genji that was a really beautifully designed 
thing that was intended to, like, be a new way that you could take English-speaking students through that whole thing. Mm -hmm. But it became very apparent to me, even with my limited knowledge of the original text, that this particular piece of education seemed to focus a lot more on explaining, like, the hierarchy and the court culture part of it. And they really skipped over a lot of, like, the sexual interludes and the the romantic yeah. part of it because I don't know how you would do that on a CD-ROM in the early 2000s without it being really, really <laughs> dicey. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah, so I came at both of these from a very pop culture place. And then just because I was curious and did my own reading, learned about them, but not from a literature class. Yeah, I, it seems like um, when I was researching the one about the pillow book that came out how, those years ago at this point, I kept finding YouTube videos from an anime. And I was like, I'm going to check that out at some point, but I never, I never did. So maybe I'll manage to do that <laughs> at some point. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm glad I finally got to move her up to the top of the list because she's been on that list l- literally since day one. And at various points, people have been like, hey, could you do an episode on her? And every time I've been like, ah, is it too similar to the thing? And then I was like, oh, it's been so long. It doesn't matter at this point. Might have been weird if we had done them back to back, but not not a big deal. There is a strange, odd satisfaction with finally getting a topic off your list that's been there for years. Yep. Yep, yeah. for sure. Okay. Ah, so. Tale of Genji. Check. Yep. yep. Thanks so much for <laughs> listening to our Casual Friday, everybody. <laughs> Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs> 